Good afternoon, everyone. It feels like it's time for another dance. Um, so, guys, you thought you'd been shortlisted for the Driving Digital Challenge. What you didn't know is you have to do it through the medium of dance. Are you ready? Yeah. Yes? <laughs> OK. Um, thanks for the, the introduction, Paul. Since 2008, Innovate UK's Independent Living Innovation Programme has invested in technological, business and social innovation around the ageing population to drive benefits to citizen health, uh, improvements to health and social care system, and generate wealth for UK PLC. We're all about accelerating UK economic growth, and we do this through connecting communities and funding. And our impact, on average, is for every pound we invest, we return six pounds of investment and around seven jobs per business, and also government savings through productivity and efficiency gains. And how we do this is we invest early when the risk is high, proving the opportunity uh, to address societal challenges and ultimately deliver growth, it, with the aim to build confidence to crowd in private investment. So we fund in two ways. We come to you with a societal challenge like our long-term care revolution competition that we recently ran. Or you come to us with an idea for smart funding. And as I mentioned, we also see the value in the connections that we can bring. So we bring together innovators with third sector, health and social care and academia through our innovation networks and our knowledge transfer networks. We are aiming to design the race courses rather than back the winners. And you'll see an example of this tomorrow in tomorrow afternoon's uh, parallel sessions here where we'll showcase and show you the outputs of our large-scale demonstrator program, Dallas. And I'd encourage you to come to that event. Uh, there's free popcorn as to incentivize you uh, as we premiere the Dallas story. Our programmes across Innovate UK cross all these sectors, but independent living is the most cross-cutting. So we're working with transport, digital, creative, high-value manufacturing and urban living to really bring those sectors together to challenge and support independent living. When we started the programme in 2008, um, it was obviously before smartphones and tablets, but now digital disruption has happened. The world's uh, largest taxi company owns no taxis, as Uber continues to disrupt the taxi industry worldwide. Digital disruption happened early in retail with the likes of Amazon, and now one of the most valuable retailers, Alibaba, holds no stock. Facebook, as the most valuable um, popular media owner, creates no content. And the largest phone companies own no telco infrastructure. And video telephone conferencing is changing the way we work, changing the way we live our lifestyles. Within health and care, though, we've seen some early digital disruption through automation, robotics, telehealth and telecare, and the growth of digital well-being apps. But we haven't seen the big transformational change as yet. And this is partly because often the risks are cited as the barriers, but what about the risks of if we don't do this? So a few quick examples where we've seen innovators exploit and disrupt business models. Shadow Robot developed a dexterous hand, and we funded them initially with £69,000 worth of investment to create their demonstrator model. They've grown as a, a micro-business from two to 21 employees. And there is huge potential in terms of the application of health and independent living as they've now created their robotic kitchen, which is mainstream technology, which can be seen in smart homes, to not only support independent living, but to help encourage people and support people in their busy lifestyles, create Michelin-level uh, cuisines in their own homes. Alert me. They sold out their Hive home energy management system, and that was acquired by British Gas for £65 million, growing a company from two to 100 employees. We supported them with their market analysis. 
And in Senius wireless monitoring, we've seen lots of press activity of late about this remote monitoring saving lives. We initially supported the prototype development of a bandage-like ECG sensor in 2012 with just 100K of investment through a Smart Award. That went on to leverage £1 million SBRI award for their patient status engine for the NHS. And they've now got a further £1.8 million investment through Wellcome Trust. So I'm thrilled to be involved, and Innovate UK are thrilled to be involved in the TSA's Delivering Digital Challenge 2015. And as I mentioned at the start, we have three shortlisted innovators that now have five minutes each to pitch to you their ideas and their innovations. In readiness for at the end of the day, before the dinner, we have a Dragon's Den style panel in, uh, somebody's gonna have to remind me of the room, Madeline. Bone Morris Lounge. So I could be mean and say, uh, we'll either hold dinner or we'll hold on the wine if you don't come to the Dragon's Den panel. Let's see how that goes down. So I'd like to firstly introduce Stephen Bradbury with Money to Go. I was sort of hoping that my initial slide would come up because it would give me the chance to say the first line, which is, there we go. I'm going to discard that. It was a picture of uh, the person who's the, the image of most of our uh, system. Uh, it's a picture of my uncle, and there we have him. It's not just a, a stock photo, it's actually the uh, photo of him on the day that he died. And he lived independently, he lived bravely and independently, and he thought that the people like you, who provide the kit, were actually the heroes that allowed him to live that independent life. But when I spoke to him, he used to say repeatedly, it's all right, but it's not good enough. And the battle that we've had is to try to create something that's good enough. And what we've done, and the why I'm pitching to you, I guess, uh, this afternoon, is that we want to move beyond the reactive care to the predictive and the preventative care. So, my uncle basically, when he wanted to fall, he wanted to fall wherever he chose to do it, which might be in the garden or on his way to the supermarket, because he used to fall regularly. And uh, so he came up with a, a mobile system. He also used to fall regularly and uh, be unconscious and be unable to press any button at all. So we built uh, uh, fall detection into that. He'd also have soft falls where he would uh, become unconscious uh, without any impact. And so we built in an unconsciousness alert as well. And we essentially uh, built it all upon a, a simple uh, uh, mobile device and we read the data. We used the accelerometers and we picked out essentially the spikes, which is when somebody would fall, or the flat lines when somebody was unconscious. And believe it or not, we chucked away all the rest of the data. We just kept those two extremes. The light bulb for me came on when I realized that what we were looking at in that data that sat between those two spikes, we were actually seeing all the opportunities there to predict when somebody fell. Because the data that we could see was showing people having small stumbles, incipient falls, and essentially we could predict, yes, with reasonable accuracy, that they were gonna fall next week or the week after. Now, at that first level, that's not a very valuable thing to do. Um, you know, it's like death, you know you're going to die, but you don't need to be reminded of it. Well, what we needed to do was actually prevent somebody falling the, uh, uh, the next week. So we worked with teams at Southampton University and Newcastle uh, University Hospital to identify three main causes of uh, fall. First one of those was to do with medication itself. The team at Southampton explained that they would hand out medication for blood pressure, blood thinning, for various bladder problems, for uh, uh, depression issues, and they knew that 70% of the population that they gave them to would be helped, 
but 30%, 30% of that population would actually be induced to fall. But the doctors who medicate the, the, uh, the drugs didn't know which that 30% population was. With our device, we're able to see when somebody has a, a beta blocker prescribed for them, and you can monitor uh, on the, the risk register of uh, green, amber, red as to whether the gait, the, the movement issues are deteriorating or not. And in the 30% that do deteriorate, you can then switch the medication and prevent the fall that that person would otherwise have had. With the same team, we looked at the second key uh, uh, cause of fall, which was to do with fluctuations in blood pressure. So we have attached to our device uh, by Bluetooth uh, a simple uh, blood pressure cuff and on a daily basis, subject to reminders that we provide people with, they take their blood pressure lying, sitting, standing. And the algorithm that we have that uh, uh, responds to those readings is a further refinement of the, uh, the risk register we have for each individual. And again, it allows intervention by the clinician that sees this uh, as it goes in, in live data. We then look at the third cause, which is to do with uh, gait itself, because people's um, muscles deteriorate, uh, the amount of uh, mobility that they have reduces, and their sensory perception uh, also is uh, affected. And we can see that change, but we've also recognized that it's possible to rectify it by different physio and uh, exercise programs, you can actually improve the, the gait of people. And if that doesn't work, then the option is still there as some form of, of walking frame. So what we're trying to do is to have a reactive device, yes, and it provides all of the opportunities that a reactive device does give you. It, it, it provides everything you need after a fall, but we also seek to build into there all the opportunities both to predict and to prevent. And what we think we have achieved here is something which also operates or provides the sort of savings that we've talked about within the NHS, and that is that we have one platform that provides a, a multiplicity of functions, and uh, we believe it enhances the independence of uh, uh, the elderly, it provides greater care and comfort to, to families, information to clinicians, and cost savings to the NHS. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Stephen. OK, I'd now like to introduce Patrick Fanner with Push to Talk. Patrick. Hi there, I'm Patrick Fenner and I'm here to show you Push to Talk today. So Push to Talk is an IoT solution and service uh, to prevent social isolation. Every service user has a button that sits by the side of their phone and if they press the button, they get an incoming phone call. We've matched them with another user who's also just pressed their button uh, and they both get an incoming call which connects them together and they can then talk about whatever they'd like for as long as they'd like and when they're finished, they put the phone down and they're done. Want to, want to talk to somebody again? Press the button again. You'll get another call. Push to Talk is a privacy aware service. The users don't get any information about each other unless they choose to share it. They both get incoming calls that come from our number. Uh, so it's the same kind of level as chatting to somebody next to you in a post office or a bus stop queue, but from wherever you are. Um, we also know that each of the service users have something in common. We group them into their um, into their peer groups. So that might be socially, uh, socially isolated elderly people who are living alone, or it might be uh, young carers who aren't physically isolated but are isolated from their peer group. Uh, and we make sure that they don't mix. We keep, uh, keep to the same peers. Uh, and Push to Talk then has the simplest possible interaction to allow people to be connected. You just press. Push to Talk is a white labeled service. Um, so it's service providers that then choose 
whether they believe users are suitable for the service, uh, and they control access to the gatekeepers then to those groups. Um, it's button agnostic, so although we do have a hardware button, and we actually have uh, an iPhone and Android app that works in the same way but provides uh, calls to mobile, um, we can actually take uh, button inputs from any other device, if there's a spare button or, or if there's a spare menu in uh, software that you're already using, we can take that input and apply the same service that way. Uh, so it can integrate with what, what you're doing already. Um, and we're actually call agnostic. We currently do voice calls on landline and on mobile, but we can extend that into video calls as well. Uh, we restrict the users to stay within their peer group, so they're always going to have something in common when they talk to each other. Uh, and then it's then the providers who are the gatekeepers for those groups, and they can switch people in and out as easily as necessary. Uh, but it means that there are no outside parties who are able to access the service. Um, if needs be, we can increase the size of a pool by allowing cross-population between providers. So even if there's a small uh, provider with a small group, we can actually mix them in with a larger group because it gets more efficient the more users there are. Push to talk as itself is intended to uh, enhance befriending services rather than having to have uh, people sat down waiting for calls coming in. Push to talk actually gets more efficient the more people are on the service. We're letting the people who want to talk talk to each other. The more people you've got, the more calls we can get with no additional costs. Um, we can. We could increase the scope by going into provider, but we also have the option to be able to pair people off um, when they have particular interests or particular commonalities. So being able to, if we're given a choice of button presses, meet, match people together who share a common native tongue, for instance, even if they're not actually in the same country. If you'd like to um, know more, please speak to me later. We have some particular safeguarding and reporting roles which I can go to in into in more detail. Um, and uh, if you would like to know more about how push to talk would fit in with your services or with your users. Uh, but to make the point, if you already know how to use a phone and you already know how to press a button, you already know how to use push to talk. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Patrick. And our third shortlisted innovator is Andrew Michelson from Care Innovation. Thank you. Disabled people are tired of being treated like footballs in a game by inadequate services and technologies. They want to be treated like players on the winning team. We know this because the disabled people who we co-created Support Space with told us this. And from what they told us, we've created this app, which is a digital marketplace app for service users, for their care workers, and for the commissioners and payers of services that they use, and that are paid for by direct payment and personal budgets. Now, what's a direct uh, a, what is a uh, collaborative marketplace app? Think of Uber, think of um, Airbnb. These are good examples where a person needs something, they use their own wits and their own uh, technology and their own devices to find what they need, and they enter into a collaborative relationship with the person who provides that service. In the case of, uh, in the case of support space, the service user is the principal user of the system or their carer. We're very keen on providing tools that care, it makes it easier for carers to care for people. Uh, if somebody needs to find a support worker, a care worker, a therapist, whatever service they need, they have a very simple set of search tools that helps them to find a person in the right location at the right time available when they say that they're going to be available and who is qualified and eligible to provide the services that the person needs. The, search will, the simple search will return a list of people who, amongst other things, have been rated by other service users, like TripAdvisor or like Amazon. So the person has a way to actually select which care worker they want to engage and they want to work with. They can also see what they charge, and they can also communicate with them through direct messaging. 
Lastly, the information that uh, is captured by the system about the amount that they spend on the services that they, that they, ent that they purchase from the uh, care worker uh, are stored by the system, can be seen by the, work by the service users themselves, and is also presented as structured data back to the payers of the service. In the case of the providers, there are some real benefits for the providers. They're, they have an easy and inexpensive way to increase the, their utilization. Uh, many personal assistants, for instance, will work part-time for one person. It would be expensive in many cases or difficult and challenging for them to increase the number of hours that they would, be work, they would work, and they would risk having their time wasted by people who are asking for things that they can't deliver. In support space, they have very easy tools in order to uh, identify what times of what days they are available to work, uh, whether there are blackout dates and whether they'll work on bank holidays, how far they're prepared to travel from their base of operations. And, and they can be confident that the search will only return them to people who are uh, asking for services that they're qualified to provide in the time frames and in the locations where they will provide them. For administrators, uh, there are real simpl uh, simplifying tools within, uh, within support space, not least of all the ability to very easily drag and drop and select fields for reporting the information about uh, the spend of individual users. In terms of the benefits to payers, um, we have identified two key areas that support space that delivers benefit. One is it virtually removes the need for any kind of brokerage service. People are empowered to arrange for the services themselves. And also by delivering uh, structured data that is user reported, they have an uh, immediate uh, and effective way of reconciling information from providers uh, that's invoiced on a monthly basis. The real benefits, of course, are to the service user. This is a great way to get service users to be enthusiastic about engaging at, at, at scale. Uh, it's a, a service that will allow the uh, direct payment and personal budget services to scale without uh, bankrupting local authorities and other uh, payer organizations uh, who would otherwise have to put large numbers of human resources in, into the workflow. So we feel that um, this is a really strong offer. We are uh, currently a finalist in the Inclusive Technology Prize. Uh, which is uh, co-sponsored by Nestor and Innovate UK. We're on three NHS test beds, and we're about to export to our first uh, partner market in Poland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. So you've now heard all three of the shortlisted innovators. So please join us and a panel of esteemed judges in the Bo Morris Lounge on level C2 at the end of the day. Uh, and remember, for those of you that don't join us, we'll hold back the wine over dinner. Um, and the winner of the TSA Delivering Digital Challenge 2015 will be announced at the gala dinner. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Okay.